Uh, very pleased tonight. Um, my name is Ed Edmonds, and I'm the host uh, for the evening, which means that largely I try to keep a little bit of order, and Steve will go ahead and, and do his presentation. I will keep track. If you want to ask a question, you can either put the question or tell me you want to ask a question in the chat room. We will do questions after the after the presentation. Um, so again, joint meeting, this is the Halsey Hall chapter, which is one that serves the upper Midwest and the Ken Keltner chapter, the Badger State chapter of Wisconsin. So on behalf of the presidents, Rich Arpey up here in Minneapolis and Dennis Degenhardt um, in Wisconsin, I welcome you to tonight and you're going to have a, a great treat. Uh, the presenter tonight is Steve Getchier, and he is the author of this uh, nice tome. Um, and that's what he's going to speak about, baseball, the turbulent mid-century years, uh, basically 1930 to 1960. And I think he'll explain the inspiration behind this and what it is a successor to. Uh, Steve's a Brooklyn native, but um, as a young man, he moved out to Long Island. And at the point that the Dodgers um, left the city, he became a lifelong New York Mets fan. His undergraduate degree came from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And he has an MA and a PhD in history from Ohio State University. I won't mention the the. Um, he's an archivist uh, during that time for the Ohio Labor History Project at the Ohio Historical Society, which I thought was really quite interesting. Um, a few years after getting his PhD, saw an ad, decided to check into the possibility of becoming an archivist for the Sporting News. And indeed, he spent a little over 20 years with the Sporting News in uh, a number of different titles, although largely um, being director of historical records, senior managing editor research or archives manager, all had a lot to do with managing the Sporting News Research Center, with both, which helped both uh, existing staff members at the Sporting News and the outside public. Beginning in 1992, he took up a, um, a long distinguished uh, role as author of the year in review, there had been some great noted uh, journalists who had that responsibility before Steve, and he held that and worked for the Sporting News until they were purchased by Street and Smith and uh, moved out to Charlotte, North Carolina. Probably the only worst thing was Mayflower um, trailers hauling the Baltimore Colts things out to, out of uh, out of uh, town. Then he spent a little over 10 years, both as an assistant and later associate professor of law at Lindenwood University um, there in St. Louis. And uh, he's also a stalwart organizer for many, many years of the nine spring training conference in Tempe, Arizona, which is coming up soon. And winner last year of the Henry Chadwick Award. So, um, Steve, I'll let you take it away and share your screen and uh, we'll get on with the evening. Okay, thank you, Ed, for those very kind words. While I attempt to share my screen, I noticed there are a couple of people who haven't muted their audio and it's probably best for everybody if you, uh, if you do so. Okay, can everybody see that and hear me? All righty, good, thank yes. you, hello. Thanks for inviting me to speak to your group uh, tonight. I'm honored and flattered to be here with you. You know, writing a book is an act of arrogance, I think. Imagine having a thought or an idea and then asserting that others should be so interested that you should put that thought or idea down on paper and ask others to read it. Yet that's what authors do all the time. And we are grateful when anyone, anyone reads what we write. 
Let me start with this quick overview. My book, Baseball, the Turbulent Mid-Century Years, is a scholarly work exploring the history of organized baseball during the middle of the 20th century. It examines the sport on the field and off the field and places its development as both sport and business within the broader contours of American history. The book combines narrative and analysis. It pays attention to most of the seasons across more than three decades, while simultaneously exploring the sport's politics and its economics. More broadly, this work is set against the great tumults of the 20th century, the Great War, the Great Depression, World War II, and the post-war transformations that defined the decades of the 1950s. I wanna do two things tonight. First, I wanna tell you a bit about how this book came to be. And second, I wanna give you a quick overview of its contents, what it's about. Let me begin to whet your appetite by reading just one paragraph. Here goes. For a decade or so, the minor leagues prospered under the rules of 1903, at least somewhat. Leagues that had been operating outside the previous national agreement joined the fold, and new leagues sprang up across the country. In 1902, 18 minor leagues had begun play, 15 within the National Association and three outside its jurisdiction. Across the country and in Canada, leagues overlapped each other geographically and club owners used colorful team nicknames to attract fans. The Jersey City Skeeters and Newark Sailors played in the Eastern League, the Peoria Distillers in the Western League, and the Binghamton Bingos and Utica Pentups in the New York State League. The Southern Association had the Memphis Egyptians, the Three I League, the Terre Haute Hottentots, the Western League, the Des Moines Midgets, and the Cotton States League, the Baton Rouge Cajuns. There were teams named for animals, bisons, broncos, bulls, colts, grizzlies, panthers, ponies, rabbits, and tigers. Birds, blackbirds, canaries, mudhens, pelicans, and redbirds. Colors, blues, browns, maroons, and reds. And occupations, brewers, clam diggers, cowboys, electricians, farmers, firemen, hustlers, marines, millers, smoke eaters, truckers, and whalers. There were colonels in Louisville, commodores in Decatur, millionaires in Colorado Springs, orators in Bridgeport, senators in Columbus and Lansing, and volunteers in Nashville. There were convicts and crooks, saints and apostles, lunatics, cotton pickers, hill climbers, gold bugs, and gas bags. And that was just the beginning. 21 leagues opened play in 1903, 34 in 1905, and 40 in 1908. By the end of the decade, 52 leagues started the season, a total that would not be surpassed until the late 1940s. Okay, thank you. Now, the origin story. As Ed said, from 1986 to 2008, well, hold on just a second. There we go. I ran the research center at the Sporting News. Lots of Sabre members, including maybe some here tonight, used the research services we provided. In that capacity, I was once part of a panel discussion on the future of baseball research. In other words, where the field was at that time and where it was going. During that session, I met Dorothy Seymour Mills, the widow of Dr. Harold Seymour. Together, they had published two foundational books on baseball history. Baseball, the early years, that takes the sport from its beginnings to 1903, when the two major leagues settled the differences between them, and baseball, the golden age, that moves the story forward to about 1930. Later, of course, they added baseball, the people's game, to complete their trilogy. At that session, I asked Dorothy what she would think 
if someone picked up the ball when she and her late husband had laid it down and wrote a solid narrative and analytical history of the game since 1930. Without hesitation, she said that this was a good idea. She heartily approved. But who would write such a book? I was well connected in the scholarly baseball history and research community, and I asked many people if they were interested in such a project. Everybody turned me down. And nearly everybody said the same thing. Steve, you should do this. My first reaction was that these folks were crazy. I was not a professor. I had a full-time job and a family to raise, but I did think about it. And then one day I sat down to lunch with the late Dan Ross, then the director of the University of Nebraska Press. And together we hacked out the beginning of what became a book proposal. Once I agreed to submit a proposal, the first question was how to define the book chronologically. In other words, where to begin and where to end. The where to end question was easier to answer. I decided quickly that taking the story from where the Seymours ended to the present would be way too much. So I settled on 1960 as an end point. The reason was quite simple. 1960, as you know, was the last season in which each major league had only eight teams. 1961, I argued, when the American League expanded from eight teams to 10, would be the start of a new era. But where to begin? You can't just start. You need a place and a reason. As luck would have it, I found the necrology section of the 1932 Spalding Guide called A Grim Harvest, an essay that noted the deaths of so many prominent baseball figures in 1931. Ban Johnson, his successor, Ernest Barnard, George Washington Bradley, who pitched the first no-hitter in the National League, Jack Cheesebro, Jimmy McAleer, Charles Murphy, and Bonesetter Reese, an idiosyncratic physical therapist. Plus, before the year was out, Gary Herman and Charles Comiskey and Barney Dreyfus a few months later. So 1931 seemed to be a turning point, the end of something old and the start of something new. I recalled, too, one of the first adult books I read, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. It became my model. It opens with the funeral of King Edward VII in 1910, the last time all the crowned heads of Europe, most of them related to one another, gathered together before the start of the Great War. Tuckman set the scene for her book with her account of this funeral, and I tried to do the same thing with the grim harvest. And with that, I had my beginning. But really, not just where to begin, but how to begin, how to do the research. I was twice blessed. The first blessing was that I presided over the Sporting News Archives, a great research library with thousands of books and thousands of brown envelopes full of newspaper clippings. The second blessing was that I was able to gain access to the note cards that the Seymours themselves had compiled for books they did not have time to write. The Seymour Collection is located at Cornell University, and I was able to go there and mine what I soon learned was a very rich collection. In addition, I had the benefit of the tremendous amount of research and publishing that Sabre members had done since Sabre was founded in 1971, the date of publication, incidentally, of the Seymour's second book. My book, therefore, would be a combination of narrative that is the story of the game, and analysis, the why and the how. It would also be a combination of my own original research while incorporating the work of others, a project that academic historians call a synthesis. That's why the notes section and the bibliography are so long, some 74 pages. Does this sound a little dull? Maybe so. I kept in mind that I was trying to write for both a scholarly audience and writing for a popular audience at the same time. I recall hearing David McCullough say, and I paraphrase here, history is not hurt 
by writing it in a way that someone may want to read it. So I decided early on to avoid the heavy language of academia and also to avoid simply telling the story of one blasted season after another. I mean, when you think about it, baseball has no plot. There's a beginning, sure, but there's no climax, no ending. There's always next year. The solution I found was two prong. First, I did not proceed strictly chronologically, season by season. Instead, I identified themes to each of which I return again and again as appropriate. Second, I decided to concentrate on people, to find one individual for each chapter, one person whose career encapsulated certain events and themes about which I wanted to write. So that's how the book came to be. Now let me talk a bit about what it's about. Understand that I did not write a series of biographical sketches. Instead, the career of one individual winds in and out of each chapter, during which I discuss the game's history, its politics, its economics, and its relationship with the rest of American history. I wound up writing a prologue and 14 chapters. In a sense, these can be divided into three sections, the Great Depression, World War II, and the post-war years. The prologue and the first six chapters, which include some considerable backstory, focus on the Great Depression. And the persons profiled therein are Ernest Bernard, the second president of the American League, Connie Mack, Branch Rickey, Kennesaw Landis, Ed Barrow, and Larry McPhail. Here we look at such things as declining attendance during the Depression downward pressure on salaries, reluctance to lower ticket prices, the contraction of the miners, the advent of radio broadcasts, battles over farm systems and the minor league draft, and various innovations like the All-Star Game, the creation of the Hall of Fame, and the establishment of numerous postseason awards. The middle section covers World War II. It homes in on Hank Greenberg, Don Barnes, and Yogi Berra. Here we see the reaction of baseball to the start of the war in Europe. FDR's green light letter, organized baseball's patriotic effort to contribute to the war while simultaneously trying to keep players on the field and spectators in the stands. The impact of the military draft, the pronounced decline in the quality of play, restrictions on spring training and travel, the change in the composition of the baseball itself, and the annual debate over whether the federal government would shut the game down entirely. The third part studies the post-war years, and its main characters are Tom Yawkey, Bill Veck, Red Barber, Ford Frick, Henry Aaron, and Bill Shea. Here we look at returning veterans, labor relations, race, demographic change, television, and the threat of government intervention, plus safer travel by air, old decrepit ballparks, problems signing young players more interested in attending college than playing in the minors, and the persistence of the peacetime selective service draft. It is a big book, admittedly, but I hope it is readable, and I hope it holds your attention. I hope, in short, but I have not been too arrogant. You can order the book directly from the publisher, the University of Nebraska Press, or from any bookstore. If you want a signed copy, send me an email and we can work that out. Let me conclude by reading just one more paragraph after which we can open it up for questions and discussion. This comes from near the end of the book and it will cover events that you will all recognize. Lurking close to the surface as the 1960 season began was the lament from the senators that Washington, a city with a long baseball history, was no longer a fit place for major league play. Clark Griffith had died in 1955, and Calvin, his so-called adopted son, succeeded him as club president. 
The younger Griffith had long expressed anxiety about the senator's future. Clark had supported the move of the St. Louis Browns to Baltimore, but Calvin had not, fearing an adverse effect on attendance from a team situated only 40 miles away. He was additionally concerned about his ballpark with the smallest capacity in the league and the deteriorating residential area in which it was located. More pointedly, he openly blamed declining attendance not on his team's poor performance, but on the evolving racial makeup of the neighborhood in which Griffith Stadium was situated. During the 1956 World Series, representatives from Los Angeles asked Griffith to consider moving there. That overture came to nothing. The next year, after Howard's, uh, excuse me, after Horace Stoneham decided not to move to Minneapolis, representatives from the Metropolitan Sports Area Commission, which had built Metropolitan Stadium, a ballpark suitable for major league play, approached Griffith about moving to the Twin Cities. Griffith expressed his enthusiasm, but remained non-committal. The Senators played an exhibition game at the Met in July 1958, but Griffith told the Kefauver subcommittee that he planned to stay in Washington, quote, as long as is humanly possible. Other owners opposed the senator's suggested move. They argued that the national pastime needed a presence in the nation's capital, and more practically, that abandoning Washington might move Congress to legislate against baseball's antitrust exemption. Nevertheless, Griffith announced after the 1959 World Series that he wanted to move. On behalf of the Continental League, Bill Shea was outraged. They knew we had the stage set to move into Minneapolis, he said. At this point, League President Joe Cronin, Griffith's brother-in-law, entered the fray, announcing the creation of a committee to study not relocation, but a new notion, expansion. Okay, that's it. Let's get out of here. And there we are. Thank okay, Steve. Okay, Steve, the, I'll exercise the um, host prerogative. I was privileged enough to be asked to write the review for your book for Nine, um, the journal. And I, I want to take this opportunity to do what you just did, which is read from my conclusion and then ask you a question. So I wrote at the end, in a nod to the work of other baseball historians, Steve, off, Steve often names his sources directly in the text. As befits an outstanding scholarly work, the 46 pages of notes underscore the author's substantial research, and they will be useful for any researcher or interested reader wanting to explore a topic in greater detail. The book also has an excellent 26-page index and 30-page bibliography. Baseball, the turbulent mid-century years is not a short read. However, Steve's writing style is crisp and clear, and even the most knowledgeable readers will find new insights. The book is a tour de force that is undoubtedly destined to become a classic, deserving a place next to the Seymour's works. Um, and the question I have is you were, you were able to mine some of their material in, in the Croc Library at Cornell, and I understand that you edited seriously this to get it down to the one volume length that it is. Do you have plans to maybe make some of those notes available to somebody who will take on the now even more daunting task of trying to write something to go with those three volumes that covers 1960 to some uh, other period, perhaps just of the 20th century? Well, uh, first, Ed, thank you for those very kind words. Um, I, I appreciate them uh, more than more than you know. Um, uh, secondly, to answer your question, if there's going to be another book, it's going to be written by someone else besides me. That's absolutely certain. No question about that. Um, I'd be glad at a certain point to turn over, you know, kind of my my copies of the Seymour materials. But, but they're open to the public. I mean, anybody can go to Cornell University to the Kroc Library and access the Seymour papers. Um, 
they, you know, the, the, the way that historians kept their notes in those days is not to use index cards because index cards are, um, are uh, expensive and thick, uh, heavy uh, eventually, but simply to take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and cut it in half and each one becomes a note card. There are boxes, box after box after box of note cards in the Kroc Library, and they're extremely well organized. I have here in my own home office a kind of edited version of, of those. But, uh, you know, it's, at a certain point, I'll be willing to give those to anybody. But anybody who wants can go to Cornell. I hear it's it's balmy. It's probably about 85 degrees in Ithaca, New York right now. And uh, have at it. Yeah, go right ahead with my blessing. But but I was actually interested in your um, collection of things that hit the, you know, that I want the the unedited version of your book. Oh, the oh, the, you mean the director's cut? No, I'm afraid yeah. that is gone. That is gone by the wayside. No, this book was far too long when I turned the manuscript in. And we made, uh, I think, uh, necessary and judicious cuts to get it down to readable length. Um, I, uh, you, you know, you have to make a calculation on how to turn the words on a what we used to call a typewritten page into the words on a printed page. And I thought I found a formula that made that calculation accurately. And it was wrong. And I was wrong. Um, if, if the press had printed the book as I had turned it in, it would have been over 900 pages. And that is ridiculous, um, absolutely ridiculous. And, and the folks at the press even talked at one point about doing two volumes and you know a so-called bound set. And my answer to that was, look, I'm pretentious, but I'm not that pretentious. Um, so no, we cut it. And, uh, and what lies on the cutting room floor stays on the cutting room floor. <laughs> well, anybody who either wants to raise their hand we've got enough that uh, that's multiple screens but also you could unmute yourself and and ask steve a question if if with the number we have here and if this is like um one of the nights in tempe uh we could be here uh, for for a while having a fabulous conversation well i got my hand raised so i'll just go ahead and uh steve first i tell you said the late Dan Ross, I didn't know he was now late, and I don't know when that happened. Maybe you can just mention it. Um, I'm going to go back and take notes, as I should have done the first time, just on the minor leagues, since that's kind of a big thing, the Minneapolis Millers, and I've always tried to understand the relation of the minor leagues to the major leagues. I knew that the majors could draft teams, eventually started buying teams, but learning about the options that, if I recall around World War I or something, the agreement was teams could uh, not could, could have options on players. And that was a big thing up until 1940, which as you point out is when it finally formalized the working agreement. Um, if a team wasn't owned outright like Newark by the Giant or by the Yankees, um, the, the Millers in 1937-38 are called a farm team of uh boston but that was just i guess that was a favorite place for them to option players because it wasn't all boston optioned players and then there were other i always call them informal working agreements up to the time of say 1940 and pipelines as we had with the yankees and st paul or even with washington and the millers around 1910 is that a fair way to summarize the pre-1940 major minor league agreement um, I, Stu, I, th I, I think it is. Um, thanks for your observations. Um, uh, I do talk about uh, extensively the relationship between the, the minor leagues and the majors and how it changed over time and the relationship uh, between the minor leagues, the various minor leagues them, themselves. Um, what, we, what we do not have as baseball historians is a good history of minor league baseball. And it is extremely complicated. Um, you know, Bob Obashki's book called Bush Leagues, which is kind of in history of the minor leagues, was published in 1975. Um, if, I were, if I were teaching in a graduate department of history and had masters and PhD students, I would turn them loose on writing histories 
of uh, of the minor leagues. It is it is it is I think vitally important to our understanding of baseball and our understanding of America for that that's, for that matter, and uh, and and terribly um, terribly underwritten, um, far too complicated to go into all of the details in a book in the book that I that I wrote. You know, I t I touch on it a lot, but there's a there's a lot that's uh, that's not there. Um, so so there's a project for somebody, a history of the minor leagues. I mean, a real history, not season by season who won the pennant, but how the business of baseball at the minor league la la level transpired and how it changed over time. Thanks, Stu. I've got at least two questions here. Um, one from Mike Hoppert is, what story was the hardest um, for you to cut and then uh, from the final book, and then I've got a question from Corey. Oh, hi, Mike. How are you? Um, the hardest story to well, I, you know, when you uh, when you have to when you write a manuscript, I'll tell the truth here. When you write a manuscript that is three hundred and thirty thousand words, and the press says you have to cut it to about two hundred and twenty thousand words. That's 110,000 words. You can't nickel and dime your way to 110,000 words. You can't eliminate all the adverbs you know, or cut out all the first names or anything like that. You have to find huge chunks to just drop. You know, It's as if you were writing a Broadway musical and, so, and after the preview, somebody says, you know, the second act is too long. And so you take a 10 minute song and you condense it into one line of dialogue. And you just let it go, you know, and so and so that's what I did. I think especially at the beginning of the long manuscript, there was a lot of what we now call backstory, background information. You know, uh, for example, in 1931, I talk about President Herbert Hoover going to a couple of baseball games, opening the season in, in Washington, going to the World Series. And that was an occasion for me to kind of kind of fill in the background on the relationship between all previous presidents and baseball, going all about way back to George Washington when his troops were playing an early variety of baseball uh, in, in, you know, during the American Revolution. Great stuff, stuff that has been written about by Sabre members, but, but stuff that I, had to, that, I, that I had to cut. And that happened, you know, that happened all the way through the book, but especially at the, uh, at the very beginning. Um, that you know, and then of course, as you as you cut stuff, you've got to make sure that you're not leaving holes, that uh, that it continues to read pretty well, that no one will be able to see the gaps that you've created, and sometimes it's necessary to move sections from one chapter to another to uh, to continue to make sense of things. Um, not not an easy task. Um, it was hard at first, um, but after a while. Uh, I guess like a like a surgeon, you know, the first time you cut into somebody, it's it's pretty unpleasant. But after a while, it's just another day's work, you know. So that's how I had to approach it. Okay, um, I've got Corey next, and then Dave, Rich, Steve, and Mary. Yeah, Steve, I've gotten intrigued by the nineteen forty two season lately. We've been we had all these fundraising games. For the military. Yes. We had these dim out games where they actually were shutting the lights off or having them in the twilight. But I've struggled to find succinct information about all of it. Mm -hmm. Does your book provide that or can you easily describe the, the Yeah, there, there 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 are good sections, I think, on on some of those wartime activities, uh, special exhibition games to to raise money for uh um uh, for the families of people who are in service, um, my, my understanding is, I hope this is correct, that if um, if a soldier were declared missing in action, his paycheck stopped. <laughs> and so money was raised. It was called, I think, the Army and Navy Relief Fund to provide funds for the families of, of, of soldiers who were who were MIA. Teams played um, uh, exhibition games. Um, uh, against the you know geographic rivals, the Yankees would play the Dodgers or whatever. The Cardinals would play the Browns. Cubs would play the um, uh, the White Sox. Um, uh, there were blackouts on the East Coast, 
So games had to be ended by uh, 8.30, no night games. Um, the idea was that, you know, enemy bombers um, flying over could pick out targets if, if ballparks were illuminated. Um, maybe the most fascinating um, exercise was the so-called war bond league. I talked about this at the nine conference a few years ago where a luncheon was held at a fancy New York hotel and prosperous businessmen and companies drafted players from the three New York teams for a certain fee and then made a commitment to buy more war bonds for every hit, every run, every home run, every RBI that their players accomplished during the season. It was kind of an early version of fantasy baseball. Ball. Uh, players were taken from the Giants. Players were taken from the Yankees. Players were taken from the uh, uh, from the Dodgers. And then I think it was in August of that year there was a War Bond League game, uh, you know, a kind of triangular game: Squad A against Squad B, Squad B against C, and then C against A. <laughs> Excuse me. That raised even more money in terms of uh, the number of War Bonds that were uh, that were purchased. So I hope to get to that, what you were talking about, Corey, just a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Dave? Yeah, uh, I see. Thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. I would like to uh, read a couple of sentences from your book and then have you comment. This is from the introduction. Uh, you wrote, uh, academic historians have struggled to have the study of baseball accepted as a legitimate subject for scholarly inquiry. These scholars have produced substantial books and journal journal articles that should have earned their chosen discipline the respect that they sought. Now, the way this is stated seems to indicate that they didn't get the respect that they were seeking. Will you comment? Well, that's 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 true. Um, I belong to a uh, an organization of academic historians called the North American Society for Sport History. Um, most of the people who belong to that organization are not PhDs in history. But uh, but or that is they don't teach in history departments, but they teach in departments of kinesiology or physical education. Um, getting a job teaching sport history in a department of history has been and continues to be very difficult. If you talk to people who have PhDs in history and who teach in history departments and who teach a course or two in sport history or baseball history, you'll find out in almost every case that that's their secondary line of inquiry. Well, I'm a Civil War historian, but I teach a course in sport history. Oh, I'm a military historian or you know a labor historian, but I teach a course in, in, in sport history. The first person to earn a PhD in history writing about baseball was Harold Seymour himself in 1955, from Cornell and his advisor, think of baseball's pastoral roots, was an agricultural historian, Paul Gates. And uh, the, you know there have been a few people since who have earned PhDs by writing a dissertation on baseball in a history department, but we are few and far between. In fact, my dissertation is not about is not about baseball history. Thank you. Sure. Rich? Um, my question is about your, your 14 major figures. Obviously, Ricky and Landis are probably no-brainers, but I thought that Bernard was an interesting choice. I knew nothing about him. Do you have any, any uh, how did you decide who, who to pick, basically? I, thanks, Rich. Um, Rich and I are old friends from the Ohio Historical Society, way, uh, back, yes, yeah, yeah. way back in the previous century. Um, uh, I, I suppose the, the choices emerged organically. Um, like you, I, I hardly knew anything about Ernest Barnard and he was a, he was a terrific person, um, a terrific baseball executive, um, a newspaper man turned, um, executive worked for the Cleveland Indians for a long time, terribly dedicated to his work. What he, I, what he was called, I guess, business manager. Now we might call it, uh, combination uh, general manager, traveling secretary. One of the great stories about Bernard is that in 1908, um, he's working in his office during a, during a game 
it was the Naps, and then I guess in 1908, not yet the uh, the Indians. And he, he was known as Barney, of course, with the name of Ernest Bernard. And somebody jumps into his office and says, Barney, you got to come outside. Addy Joss is uh, pitching a perfect game. And he says, sorry, <laughs> can't go. Got too much work to do, setting up the next road trip. You know, So he was dedicated to his work. He became Ben Johnson's uh, successor. Um, uh, I, I think league executives liked him so much that they were very, very glad to appoint him president when Johnson finally resigned. And then he dies a tragic death um, at the same time that 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 Johnson does. So that his story, because I didn't know about it, um, just became uh, just became a natural. And as I as I went on and thought about, well, what do you want to talk about next? How does all this fit in? Um, you know, you can't ignore Mac. You can't ignore Ricky. You can't ignore Ed oh, Barrow sure. developing the Yankees. You can't ignore Larry McPhail for the great entrepreneur that he was. Um, some more prominent than others. Um, some uh, because I wanted to make certain points. Yawkey, I think, because I wanted to talk about race. And that's a good way to do that. Um, Bill Shea, um, because I wanted to talk about expansion and the Continental League. Um, maybe the, the the choice that was the last to make, I guess, was, uh, was, uh, was Henry Aaron. That chapter, I think, originally was going to focus on Dick Grote because Ricky had signed him for the Pirates. He had been a you know a college athlete, college player of the year in basketball. Um, and as I proceeded through that chapter, it just didn't work. Um, there was too much about growth that I didn't want to talk about. And there were other things I did want to talk about that had nothing to do with growth. And so I traded growth for Henry Aaron and that worked out, uh, that worked out a lot better hmm. in baseball terms and in terms of scholarship. Yeah, very good book, Steve. Very good. Enjoyed Thank you it. very much. I think we have another Steve who's next on my list. If I'm out of order, then Mary can go next. Yeah, I was wondering, first of all, Steve, where are you from in Brooklyn and Long Island? Oh, well, um, I, you know, I was born in Brooklyn, but my parents lived in Queens. The hospital was in was in Brooklyn. Um, my uh, my parents lived with my mother's parents in Middle Village, if you know where that is, um, about uh, about three blocks away from Archie Bunker's house, I, I, I would say. <laughs> but, but but, you know, I don't remember those years because when I was a year and a half, we moved out to the suburbs to Hicksville in the middle of Nassau. Nice. My mother grew up in Laurelton. Which oh, is, well, there you go. Which would have been north. Do you know where that is? Uh, Laurelton. Uh, Just north of JFK, but JFK yeah, didn't exist back then. Right. So. Yes. In the yeah. southern part of Queens. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And my daughter lives in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Oh, the Bushwick well, there you neighborhood. go. Yeah, it was yeah. very industrial probably when you were in New York. And well, now it's I'm, hipster. So. The first five <laughs> days of my life, I was resident in a hospital in Brooklyn. Yeah. So I get it. So, so my question was, you know, New York was such the capital of, of baseball and where baseball originated. So does your book kind of emphasize New York baseball? Well, I think when appropriate, you know, I don't mm -hmm. overdo it, but like certain other people have, you know, um, uh, folks with that New York background talk about the golden age of baseball. And they mean, you know, 1947 to 1961, when one of the New York teams was in the World Series, like all the time. Um, but aside from that, you know, if you look at the attendance figures, in uh, baseball generally, except for the teams that moved and New York teams in particular, um, it goes down and down and down. You know, the Yankees peaked in what, 47, I think, with over 2 million fans. And I don't think they drew 2 million until 1977 or 19, uh, through 2 million again until 1977 or 1978. I, I once had, I, I was privileged as, as those of us who attend the nine conference were to become friends with Leonard Coppett and I once had a really nice discussion with Leonard <laughs> about that term, golden age. And I said, Leonard, you know, the attendance was 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 dropping year after year. You know, even in 1951, at maybe the most famous baseball game of all time to that point, the third game of the playoff between the Dodgers and the Giants, 34,000 people were there and 17,000 seats were empty. 
So what kind of golden age is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I talk about New York, but I hope without that kind of New York bias, you know, I hope. Well, everything is about media money now. So was was radio revenue a factor or was it just bodies in the seats? Uh, well, uh, bodies in the seats, I think, you know, ticket sales were still the primary source of, mm -hmm. of, of income. Where radio and TV money really helps out is, is that the commissioner, um, uh, Landis and then and then Chandler and then Ford Frick they negotiate with sponsors to uh, to sponsor the All Star Game and the World Series and those revenues fund the pension plan um, and the players you know the players came together in the late forties not really with the labor union not with the players association yet but with some kind of organization saying you know we've got to change things a little bit for the better we're not opposed to the reserve clause. But one of the things we need, and Marty Marion of the Cardinals was the prime mover here, was a pension plan. Uh, the players contributed to it at least a little bit at the very beginning, but the bulk of the funding came from radio and television broadcasts of the All-Star Game and the World Series. And certainly that's one big step on the modernization of the sport. I don't think there's any question about that. That's really interesting. Thank you. And yeah, I see your sweaters you. covering up what looks like a Brooklyn t-shirt. Oh, right? Well, it's Jackie Robinson's birthday. Yes, so. it is Jackie Robinson's birthday. And Ernie Banks. And Yes, and Noah we've raised Ryan. enough money already to replace that statue that was destroyed the other day. Tremendous, yeah. And good job on moving on to Hank Aaron from Dick Rote. Oh, yeah. I live in Milwaukee, so it's like, <laughs> oh, he's yeah. my favorite well, player all time. You so. know, as, as, as a player, I, you know, I love Dick Rote. You know, he does, he did so many things well. Um, but he just didn't fit, so out he went. Thank you. I think I've got Bob next. Let me unmute myself there. Uh, Steve, uh, my question is, what was your biggest uh, revelation uh, that you came across? And what were some of the biggest surprises that you, uh, that, that you discovered in your research? Well, I, you know, as I said to Stu, trying to figure out how the minor leagues worked. Um, the draft, the working agreements, the farm systems. I think that was uh, that was uh, certainly important um, to me. Um, maybe the biggest revelation, well, a couple. One is, um, I do not believe that Landis was all powerful. In fact, after he bans the Black Sox, there's not much he does uh, that is terribly significant. He's on the wrong side of the night baseball argument. Um, yeah, and he's yeah. on the wrong side of the development of farm systems. He antagonizes, or Ricky antagonizes him. They battle, but uh, but he loses. And when the Yankees finally buy a farm team in the late 1930s, the richest team in baseball, when when they when they buy a farm team, uh, uh, the game is over. Um, and and Landis uh, is 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 virtually powerless. Um, so that's one thing that kind of surprised me. The other thing. Is um is this notion uh, concerning um, Roosevelt's green light letter? Remember now, let's set the stage here, and I'll and I'll tell people what I'm uh, what I'm what I'm talking about. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December seventh, nineteen forty one. Um, the United States declares war on Japan within a couple of days, and it's the off season, and baseball is wondering. What exactly is going to happen between now and April? And will we have a baseball season in 1942? Landis and Roosevelt were political enemies. Roosevelt was, of course, a Democrat. Landis was a Republican. He had grown up as a progressive Republican, a follower of Teddy Roosevelt, FDR's distant cousin, but had become more conservative as time went on. He was an opponent of the New Deal. Um, and yet and yet he feels compelled in some way to approach the president and ask him about the future of baseball now that the United States has declared war on Japan. And the people who will be fighting that war are the same age group as the people who will be playing will be playing professional baseball. So Landis writes the president a letter. Now get this. He writes the letter handwritten in pencil. 
Is that a little bit of uh, disrespect, perhaps? And uh, Roosevelt takes the letter under advisement, and he responds and says baseball should continue. Um, this is called the green light letter. Baseball has a green light. Baseball can continue to play. The letter is published in full on the front page of the Sporting News in February of 1942. And some people suggest that even though naming the Major League Player of the Year is something that should be done at the end of the year, we could make PR the Player of the Year, even though it's only February. But if you read that letter, Carefully, Roosevelt hedges his bets. He says, on the one hand, baseball should continue, but those who are eligible for military service have to fulfill <laughs> their obligation. So if the sport's going to continue, who's going to play it? <laughs> Secondly, he says, oh, and by the way, if we're going to continue baseball, let's play some more night games. And I'm sure Landis grit his teeth when he read that sentence as well. So the green light letter is not quite as green as it's generally perceived to be. Moreover, the argument over whether or not there should be baseball during the war excuse me, was not settled in February of 1942. It was a question that was asked during every off season. And especially in the winter of 1944-45, when, when Burns, J Jimmy Burns, the director of war mobilization, said, no more. Are we going to let baseball players slide by? They're going to have to fight it in 1945. You know, if the, if the war hadn't turned, if the Battle of the Bulge hadn't been successful, there may not have been a 1945. Hmm. So that's all new to me as well. <laughs> kind of following <laughs> up on that, Steve, um, talk a little bit about the chapter that features Yogi Berra. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, you know, I, we live in St. Louis and uh, and Yogi is a native of St. Louis. The Barra home where he grew up across the street from the Garagiola home is still there. And I just learned a few weeks ago that it's been turned into a bed and breakfast. You can sleep um, in Yogi's bed. Isn't that amazing? I drove, I drove by there when I was down in St. Louis um, visiting Frank Hodak yeah. and and. Susan Tulis and uh, yeah, we had to make a special trip out to uh, see the um, things that have been erected in the yard. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a sign there and people are still very proud of Yogi. Yogi's a, a, a tremendous hero in, uh, in, in, in St. Louis. Uh, Yogi was in the Navy and he's the only ball player uh, to participate that I know, the only ball player to participate in the D-Day invasion. Now he was in the Navy, so he did not come ashore but he was on a small boat that provided uh, anti-aircraft and uh, and rocket fire support to the to the troops who did uh, who did storm the beaches at uh, at Normandy. Um, uh, Yogi uh, uh, hoped to you know he had been a minor league player, hoped to be able to play ball in the uh, in the army. Uh, got excuse me in the navy. Got bored. Heard someone talk about uh, rocket boats. That's what these little boats were called. Thought he heard rocket ships. You want to be on a rocket ship? He put down his comic book and said, hell yes, I want to be on a rocket ship. <laughs> well, it wasn't quite that simple. And so he participated in the, in the, in, you know, in the, in the D-Day invasion. And, uh, and those memories stayed with him, as you might expect, for the rest of, uh, for the rest of his life. Um, served for the duration. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't start playing professional baseball again until 19, uh, 1946. And then, of course, put put together this absolutely legendary career um, uh, as player, coach, and uh, manager. Ten Rings, I think, is the is the uh, is the title of one of the books about Yogi, and uh, and rightly so. Just a, just a great fella. If you haven't seen the uh, the documentary that his granddaughter Lindsay has put together, I think it's on Netflix. It ain't over. Is that what it's called? It's 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 terrific film. Well worth your time. You got any more questions? Please jump in. The um, is, is, is it really the case in the '30s during the Works Progress Works uh, projects, the WPA? Is this where we hit the big turning point on public participation in building of ballparks? 
Well, it certainly it certainly started uh, about that time. The Cleveland Stadium, um, the mistake on the lake, Cleveland Municipal Stadium was built mm -hmm. with public funds, but it wasn't built primarily for baseball. It was built because Cleveland hoped to attract the 1932 Summer Olympics. Of course, those games went to Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, you know, the Indians played a few games there. But when Vec takes over, you know, he makes the move out of League Park. So I think Cleveland Municipal Stadium is probably the first publicly funded major league ballpark. But yes, there were WPA funds that were used to renovate, um, to fix up, and uh, and to even to build from scratch some uh, some neighborhood ballparks and some minor league ballparks. I think you're right there, Stu. Yes, Bob. Yes, um, Steve. Earlier you talked about um, the um, uh, benefit games for. Um, for the armed forces uh, members. Um, but during the 30s, there were also um, benefit games played for the unemployed in, in particularly New York and Chicago. The uh, famous photo of um, uh, Gabby Hartnett and Al Capone was taken at a uh, benefit game at Comiskey Park between the Cubs and the White Sox, which was for the, um, I believe it was for the governor's or the mayor's unemployment fund. And that was in 1931. So that was before Roosevelt. You talk about um, any of those games, uh, exhibition I, games, in your book. I, I, I do not, no. It's, some things didn't wind up on a cutting room floor because they weren't in the first draft. You just you just <laughs> can't do everything, and that's something that uh, that uh, flew by the wayside. Because okay. yeah, I find it very interesting because they were quite common, though, in a lot of yeah. – uh, particularly in, 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 in two – um, two team cities like St. Louis, Philadelphia, Chicago, and yes. and New York and Boston as well. I think every yes. every city, um, you know, had, had at least one um, uh, benefit game of that sort. Right. You know the uh, you know as as the depression um, began in 1930, 1931, there was there was still the the generally held belief that private charity would solve these problems. And of course, private charity was was completely inadequate to the task. Um, Herbert Hoover did not recognize that, or at least did not know what to do. Um, Roosevelt didn't know what to do either, but he said, "We're going to try some things and see what works." That was that was the New Deal. But yeah, so games like that, you know, it's like selling apples on the on the street corner. We'll do anything to uh, to put some money into the economy. Steve, say, tell tell the group here a little bit about um, Emmanuel Seller, his um, monopoly subcommittees, uh, ventures into baseball's antitrust exemption, and and um, what Congress got kind of enmeshed in um, in the 1950s. Sure. Well, now I'm being set up, guys. This is a question about a lawyer <laughs> from a lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I need to tread very carefully. Emanuel Seller was a was a longtime Democratic congressman from Brooklyn. Um, he was uh, always interested in monopoly and antitrust legislation, um, held hearings um, a variety of times. And in 1951, concentrated among on other topics, but including including Major League Baseball and its antitrust exemption. There were um, there were bills introduced. Um, but no one quite knew which way to go. Should we legislate and make baseball's antitrust uh, exemption part of the law? Or should we remove it uh, entirely? Should we reverse the Supreme Court decision from 1922, say that baseball is in fact engaged in interstate commerce and remove the antitrust exemption, make baseball subject to antitrust laws? Um, Seller wanted to investigate his subcommittee on monopoly power, on the study of monopoly power, held hearings in the summer of 1951 and then in the fall of 1951. And the uh, testimony uh, from the hearings runs to, uh, oh boy, what is it, 1,800 pages, I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's even larger than your book. It is larger than my book and not as well written either, <laughs> uh, I must I must say. You know, first witness, Ty Cobb, you know, Taylor Spink, president of the Sporting News, um, uh, testifies. Ford Frick testifies. Happy Chandler testifies. Presidents and uh, executives from Major League and Minor League Baseball testify. 
And most of these people just go on and on and on and on. Um, the subcommittee res, uh, produces a 230 or so page report following year and basically decides to do nothing. But for a while, baseball was scared, really scared that something would happen and they weren't sure what. Um, uh, uh, Chandler was leaving office. Uh, Ford Frick was coming in. Ford Frick, maybe not our strongest commissioner. Um, and baseball did not have a game plan. Um, so different officials uh, uh, emphasize, as we now say, different talking points. They weren't all on, to use modern terminology, they weren't all on the same page. Uh, the hearings are fun to read. Um, they're interesting, but boy, it takes a long time to read through 1,800 pages of congressional testimony. <laughs> There is a lot of um, business um, information in there, economic information that a lot of people have not yet mined. But, yes. but I agree, the pros and the length of the document uh, is on par with the Internal Revenue Code. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, baseball was forced to produce financial statements on, you know, all manner of, of, of ways. And, and that data is extremely valuable. Yeah. If, if Mike Hoppert is still on, maybe he can talk. I'm sure he's looked at that and can maybe want maybe wants to say something about it. I don't know. Mike, I'm putting you on a spot here. Yeah, thanks. I, I have a couple copies of it, and it is really valuable information. David Surdam wrote a book about baseball during the Depression, and he used a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what it's really useful for is double checking other material because uh, you can you can pretty well verify. I mean, you can accept that it's probably truthful information that they were turning over because they did have to, um, you know, swear in court. It was, you know, they were testifying before Congress. So if they gave them false information, they, you know, they could be liable for perjury, I suppose. Yeah, yeah good. Thank you, Mike. Yes. I don't know that those hearings have been digitized. Um, they not what I know actually, of, but it's not hard to find a paper copy of it. Yeah, the ProQuest, ProQuest, which is digitized um, hearings and kind of all manner and form of congressional stuff, has done that. So, yeah, I had to leave my uh, print copy mic behind at Notre Dame when I left, but I do have a digital version. Takes up a lot less room on a shelf. <laughs> right. Yeah. As someone once said, don't don't read this book and don't drop it on your foot. I, anybody I, I, else? I'm still at the I'm I'm still on the Hank Greenberg section, so I haven't got to Don Barnes yet. Uh, so maybe to give give a spoiler or a spoiler alert to anybody else. Um, how close did it really happen for the Browns to move to LA? It's just, it's one of those, hey, that story really sounds good. December 6th, they were all set. And, you know, what would the history of baseball been like afterwards? But uh, how close was that to happening? Well, Barnes was the owner of the Browns, of course. And I think, I think he was like, uh, I've never owned a boat, but you know the old saying that the two happiest days are the day you buy the boat and the date you sell it. And I think the two happiest days in Don Barnes' life were the day he bought the Browns and the day he sold them. But midway in his tenure, he did put in place a plan to move the Browns out of St. Louis, believing that St. Louis could not support two major league teams and move them to Los Angeles. And he had talked to Los Angeles officials and he'd even worked out a draft schedule that would take care of travel in the pre-airplane era. Um, he had talked to American League owners to kind of grease the skids. And uh, the American League was scheduled to meet on Monday morning, December 8th, 1941, in Chicago. Um, his underlings, including Bill DeWitt, the uh, father of the, of the present owner of the Cardinals and the grandfather of the present president of the Cardinals, um, was at a pro football game. The Chicago Cardinals were playing when they make a public address announcement that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. DeWitt turns to the guy next to him and says, what the hell is Pearl Harbor? Nobody knew uh, what that <laughs> was. Um, but the American League did did meet on, uh, on the 8th. The Barnes proposal was brought up for a vote. 
And my understanding is it lost eight to nothing. Even he voted against it. I mean, the idea on December 8th was, you know, yesterday, Pearl Harbor, tomorrow, perhaps California. So we certainly weren't going to put a major league baseball team in harm's way. And uh, any and idea lost. what the vote would have been without Pearl Harbor? I th I think it might have passed. You know, as 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 conservative as baseball owners were, I think it was pretty clear that the Browns in St. Louis were a losing proposition. Mm -hmm. Remember, their total attendance for one season was seventy eight thousand for the season. <laughs> you know, and even you know, you know, later on, of course, two or three owners later, Beck owns the Browns. And the old the old joke is so someone calls the Browns office and says, what time is the game today? And the person on the other end of the phone says, I don't know. What time can you make it? You know, we'll start. We'll start whenever um, uh, they they leave. But of course, for Baltimore, not Los Angeles. But I think it, it, it might well have passed. Well, speak, speaking of the West Coast, talk a little bit about Ford Frick putting um, in you know, hurdles in the way of the Pacific Coast League's desire to be named a major league or to up its status anyway. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the people I talk to about Ford Frick is Dave Bomer, who's writing a biography of Frick. And uh, he has a much higher opinion of him as a leader than uh, than I do. I think I think Frick waffled a lot. Um uh, but especially when it came time to, uh, you know, to get the major leagues to Los Angeles in some fashion, whether it meant um, elevating the Pacific Coast League into a third major league, moving existing teams to the West Coast or expanding beyond two eight team leagues. Um, Frick was seemingly on both sides of every question. Well, let's do it. Let's not do it. Um, maybe we can do it this way, but maybe we can't do it this way. Um, here are the things you have to do to uh, make this happen. And oh, by the way, once you do those, we'll we'll put some other barriers in your place, uh, in uh, in your way. Um, uh, he's 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 not quite sure. He doesn't know how to handle television, and he doesn't know how how to handle the fact that the United States in the 1950s is changing. The population is moving south and west. And that there are millions of people who want to be Major League Baseball fans in person, and the current structure, the then current structure of two leagues of eight teams each, just does not uh, just does not satisfy them. And Frick does not know what to do when he says it's a league matter. He's he's basically saying, please let it be a league matter. Don't make me make a decision. Now that's my opinion of Ford Frick. Others may disagree. I think Dave Bomber disagrees. So it goes. Steve, do you think it's time to reevaluate um, Happy Chandler's um, reputation? Uh, I like Happy Chandler. Yeah, you know, um, he made a couple of mistakes in, in terms of trying to get his contract extended prematurely. Um, but other than that, you know, he, uh, he certainly was on Ricky's side in the integration battle. And, uh, and he was a forward thinker on the pension plan and on radio and television. Um, had he remained as commissioner, I think he would have continued to do good things. So, yeah, maybe yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think his nickname we hold against him, happy is <laughs> meaning, you know, happy-go-lucky and not serious. <laughs> I think you can be happy and serious at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah the, the impression I get from from some oh, new articles I've read in the past few years is that, is that yes, he needs to be reevaluated and he... he did a lot more positive than negative things for the games, yeah. um, and that's based on um, you know a few articles that that, that have been uh, come out, I believe, in nine publications though, and some other some other reevaluations. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of like how we evaluate presidents. Sometimes, sometimes the ratings change. You know, in in other cases, however, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Manly. Okay. Ed, have we looked at the chat? I have not looked at the chat. I've been following it. Okay, um, good. Manly right. has a hand up, and uh, yeah, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. Okay, good. All right. Well, maybe that's it. Huh? Thank <laughs> you.
I was having trouble getting unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, Ricky and Bill Vec seem to get the, the most attention as far as integration of baseball. Um, who who else would you uh, put in the uh, list of those people who were most influential in terms of uh, integrating baseball? Well, I would certainly give credit to um, um, African-American players, first of all, for demonstrating their ability over many decades uh, that they could play major league caliber baseball. And then I would credit um, uh, several journalists, most of them African-American, but not exclusively, who, uh, who pushed for the integration of baseball. Um, uh, and uh, then, as you, you know, as you correctly point out, Ricky in the National League and Vec in the American League are the uh, are the two who really uh, push it first. Um, uh, maybe surprisingly, Horace Stoneham, the owner of the Giants, um, is uh, is more willing to employ black ball players than most of his other colleagues. Uh, you know, we 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 celebrate Jackie Robinson. We celebrate Larry Doby. We celebrate. 1947, um, but it, uh, but baseball did not make steady progress. Um, teams took a while to integrate, and of course, the Red Sox are the last um, fully what 11, 12 years after after Robinson before the Red Sox sign and play uh, Pumpsy Green. So this is uh, this is a feather in baseball's cap, but it's not a huge feather. Um, you know it. Uh, uh, the, the the celebrations in which we engage every April mask the fact that uh, this was a long, slow path that required a lot of effort um, by uh, by activists to, to to make it happen. Talk a little bit about the beautiful cover on the book. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, I wanted to use that painting. Um, I, I know the artist, that is the fellow who painted the picture, uh, Craig Kreindler. Um, uh, we, we did a little bit of work together a long time ago. And when I saw that painting, I said, this is not a famous game. It's Jackie Robinson, yes, but he's not sliding into Yogi Berra in the World Series. He's sliding into Andy Semenik in just an ordinary National League game. But it seemed to me that it was evocative of the themes and the era about which I write, besides which it's a terrific painting. So I contacted uh, Greg and, uh, and he said, yeah, you know, you can use it and you can, and you can use it um, without paying a fee. Um, the press then, when I approached them said, we like this as a cover, except this painting is based on a photograph and the photograph is owned by Getty <laughs> and uh, and Getty still has it under copyright, and they're not going to give it to us for free. Um, so we had to pay a fee to use the painting based on the photograph on the cover of the book. That's as far as my involvement went. Um, the designers at the press then did the rest. Um, and if you want to hold it up again, they took the painting and put it on the top of the book, and took a created a big red pennant. <clears throat> put it on the bottom of the front and 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 made sure that the title of the book baseball was in big letters not only on the front but on the spine so if it's sitting on the shelves at barnes and noble it's pretty clear what this book is about um so my credit really you know first of all my thanks to to the artist but uh, my thanks also to the designers i think it's a very handsome dust jacket um i love it when i look at it um and i can say that because i didn't do it somebody else did Steve, going back to integration, was Lester Rodney instrumental in getting integration? Or I know he made uh, a big push. Was um, was it effective? He he was yes. Lester, Lester Rodney, the one one of the writers for the uh, um, for the Daily Worker, um, didn't didn't I just read a piece somewhere that kind of says we've overplayed the hand on Lester Rodney, and he wasn't quite as influential as as people have uh, have said. Is that in nine? Ed, I don't remember. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, 
the uh, the Communist Party of the United States was uh, uh, was a, a vocal opponent of Jim Crow and was therefore in favor of destroying baseball's color line. How much influence he had, uh, that's uh, open to, uh, to to discussion. Yeah, but he was one. But, you know, Wendell Smith and, and the mm -hmm. other writers, sports writers in the African-American press were pushing all the time to uh, to integrate baseball. Who were some of the white writers in New York City? Um, uh, weren't weren't they instrumental as well too? I'm thinking yeah, of people. I think, at, uh, I think Jimmy at, Cannon, Bob. Jimmy, Jimmy Cannon, Cannon is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he was was he with the Herald Tribune at the time? I don't think or, he was uh, with the Herald Tribune. You know, at the, in the in the late 1940s, New York, believe it or not, New York had 13 daily newspapers. <laughs> um. So you know to keep track of who was writing for who. Well, that's 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 it's above my pay grade. Right? We know it wasn't Dick Young, in other words. Well, it, you know, <laughs> you know, the Dick Young of the late forties was not the Dick Young of the nineteen seventies. That's for sure. <laughs> Dick Young made his contributions. There's no, there's no question about it. But yeah, Jimmy Cannon was certainly was certainly one. You know, but but he was not he was not alone. Steve, when did Dan Ross leave us? I just found that out on you. Um, Boy, uh, it, Stu, it's been at least 10 years, I think. Oh. He left the University of Nebraska Press to become the director of the University of Arkansas Press. And I think it was a couple of years after that that he, I think he had a heart attack. I'm not sure about okay. that. He would have still been pretty young. Yes, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? I I do know, following up on, on Bob's question, that the um, ordinance, the anti-discrimination ordinance in the city of New York, that there was a lot of pressure put on, particularly the three New York teams, mm -hmm. um, to lift the racial barrier. Yeah. I believe Mayor LaGuardia was even involved in that. Yes, uh, right. In, in lobbying too, as I recall. Yes, that's that's right. Yeah, and of course Ricky goes from the Dodgers to the Pirates, and uh, and and feels free to uh, uh, to sign black players for the for the Pirates system, uh, and including drafting a, a a Latin American player named uh, Roberto Clemente from the Dodgers system. Yeah, pretty good move that. Anyone else? All right. Okay. As I, you know, as I said earlier, the book is readily available. And if you're tired of reading books and want to listen to one, this is available as an audio book as well. Thank you all for your uh, attendance, for your attention, for your comments, for your questions. And uh, uh, I, I I really appreciate it. You know, like I, when I when I said up top um, that uh, uh, it's a high honor when anybody reads what you've written, I really really mean that. Um, it's affected me more than I thought it would. I've written this book, and someone comes up to me and says, "I bought your book and I read it, and it is it is an <laughs> indescribable blessing." So thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a tremendous effort, and I, I do stand by um, my idea that it's that it's a worthy um, addition to the Seymour's work and is, I, I think you've got some awards coming your way um, when book awards for 2023 books are done, and um, it's just, um, it's just a tremendous read. And, and I do mean it's a joy to read. So I think that's um, something strong to be said for it. Um, I also think it's worth a shout out to the Minnesota and Wisconsin group that, that showed up in number uh, 35. I think that's, um, I know Steve's done some of these other presentations, but I think we probably um, had the best attendance and um, for those of, I'm new to this chapter, but for those of us who are very proud of being the first uh, named um, MVP chapter, um, 
and the Wisconsin chapter is also um, extremely strong. So we we think Wisconsin and Minnesota have um, some of the strongest, if not the two of the strongest um, chapters in Sabre. I know Stu, Stu would be happy to follow up on that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's great doing joint meetings, you know, not just like, hey, we have an idea. Do you as other chapter members want to attend? And it's kind of a tag along thing, but to you know make sure it's an equal equal thing. And it's and we have other chapters, you know, Iowa chapter two, the field of dreams might be something that we want to um, get them involved in too as, as an equal partner in these things. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say this was fascinating. I mean, you sold a book. I, you know, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate very it. fascinating discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll eat tomorrow. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, thanks, Steve. That's okay. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Happy Saber, Happy Saber Day. Yes, and enjoy the season. All right. Bye bye. Bye.